for hope and life and truth. May we celebrate that this morning, God. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 You can be seated. Thank you. Let's hear for Jay Wood, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And uh, thank you guys for being a part of this. Thanks for coming. Uh, Luke 21 is where we are at Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. We got a lot to do today. We got a long way to go and a short time to get there. And, and we want to have a, a, a special prayer time at the end. I want us to pray just on behalf of our church and everything that's going on this week and pray for the services on uh, a Sunday. So we're going to do that after uh, I uh, share a little bit. We have a little time at our table, and then we'll, uh, what? Speak up. Speak up. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so, we, hey! Here we go, here we go, he's okay, let's go. Uh, Luke 21, Luke, and uh, our assignment is t to do this whole chapter uh, t uh, today, and, uh, we're just going to mention, mention uh, 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 just a lot of it, but it's, it's uh, a fascinating, and uh, I guess Sean makes these assignments, and, and uh, 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 I didn't choose this, I was assigned this, but I want to be faithful with my assignment, but, but in um, the whole point of this, uh, it seems to me, of, of, of Luke 21, of course, uh, and starting in Luke 22, 23 and 24, uh, last chapters of Luke, of course, is the crucifixion. There's all of that, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. So th that's, uh, that's just about to happen. So 21 is one of the last uh, kind of things that uh, happen until the, the uh, final journey of Jesus and the disciples to Jerusalem uh, to be crucified. And so it's, it, it's kind of fascinating because chapter 20 is that Jesus is in discussion with all the scribes and Pharisees, and they're saying all this stuff, and they're challenging him, and Jesus just questioning him, and just all, all the, I mean, you ought to read that, it's pretty fascinating, but they, they're ch in chapter 20, they're challenging his authority, and, and, and who he is, of course, he, 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 uh, calm, he, he uh, calmly responds to that, to who he is, he, he destroys their strategy about life and a ministry, and, and, and uh, he demolishes their, uh, their uh, uh, theology of just where they are. He, uh, he declares his own deity in the midst of the face of that, and they attack him for that. And then, and then at the end, he, um, he uh, denounces their hypocrisy. These are the, real, uh, uh, the uh, religious leaders, and he, he just uh, he, he denounces them for their hypocrisy, for their pride, for their greed, for their ungodliness and they have this form of religion but obviously they are not representing God and it, 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 it's just a religion it's a way to make money for them and so uh, 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 and then in chapter 21 uh, verses 1 through 4 is an interesting little story about the widow's might now everybody knows about the widow's might right you've heard that little story about the, the widow and it gives and gives everything she's got and, and, and then after that he makes, he gives some signs about, about what's coming and what's coming for them, these disciples in the next 40 years, what, what, what's coming for the church and for Christians in, at the end times and all that. He makes an amazing statement about that. He, he, he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then at the end of the chapter, he's going to make some amazing statements about, about uh, a sign to the coming of the Son of Man when Jesus comes back. And he's going to have a little message there, and, and it's going to be awesome. But it's fascinating in the midst of all of that, why they included this little bitty, fascinating little story about this widow and her gifts of two mites. And so uh, the uh, a message is the sign of the widow's might. We'll talk about that real quick. Signs of what's coming, and then signs of the coming of the Son of Man, and then we're going to finish again with the sign of this widow and what she is, and this is the point. So look at verse 1, chapter 20. We've got to hurry through this. Jesus looked up and saw the rich. Now, again, he's been discussing with all these things in the temple, all these things, and all of a sudden he finds a place. He stops. He's quiet. He, he's, he's in the temple near the court of women where women could go and make their, sac their sacrifices and offerings and all that stuff. 
and, and he just finds a place. He looks up and he sees what's happening there. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts in the offering box. And he saw a poor widow. So put in two small copper, copper coins, the two smallest coins that uh, there are. And he said, after watching that, he says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. Not just more than just any one of the big gifts, more than all of them combined, all of their stuff, all of their, all of their things they did. This widow who gave the least, and actually it was the most. And so he says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her of poverty put in all that she had to live on. Just, he, he's standing there, he sees the rich and what they do, and of course, it's, it, 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 it just in there watching, and something catches his eye, and he sees all of the, <coughs> excuse me, the glamour, the, uh, the, the, the noise of these rich people just uh, uh, throwing massive gifts into this thing and uh, uh, giving their donations, and then he, something else catches his eye, and he sees this widow. And obviously this widow, obviously the, the language of the New Testament is extremely poor, the poorest of the poor, and she's there. And now scholars uh, uh, have, have you study all this and say he was uh, uh, near the court of the women, and right there on the colonnades in this little uh, column, there are 13 huge offering boxes uh, shaped like trumpets, uh, overlaid in gold, just massive things, and, and uh, a gift would ever be given to the poor or uh, a, a, to the sacrificial system of just, of just keeping up the, the temple and all of that. And, uh, of course, we don't know what happened exactly like this, but it could have. I mean, she's just standing there. Jesus notices her, which reminds us as well, you know what, Jesus sees everything. I mean, everything. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're giving. And he knows how much you're giving, why you're giving how you give, he, he, he knows everything. And he sees this woman, and you know what? Just maybe she's standing there, and obviously she reaches into her purse or whatever, and she has two little coins, and the, and the text says this is all this woman has. She doesn't have something left behind. She doesn't have something she, she's expecting to use later. She's got these two coins, and so maybe she's, she's looking at the boxes. One says for the poor, maybe I should... I give it to the poor. The one says to the sacrifice of the, of the whole system and, 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 and a, a, a gift to it, a God essentially and just, just helping. It's, it's for scholarships to help poor uh, buy an offering and all of this. It just, it, and she said, what am I going to do? And all of a sudden, maybe she decides, you know what? Hey, I got two. I'm going to give one and keep the other one. So I got something to live on. And then something happened in this widow. Something took place. And the widow decides, I'm giving it all. And she takes both coins and throws them uh, uh, in there. And just, now there is obviously, the whole point of it is, men, there's a spirit of the gift and there's a sacrifice of the gift. Of course, the spirit it's how this gift is a giving grudgingly or just a surrender of heart and say, you know what, I'm giving all that I have to the poor, she says, and to the Lord. And just the gift given, just because it's given by the Spirit, as a result of the Spirit in the giver, that a giver who just can't help to give and, and gives without a grudge, but it's just an overflow of the loving heart and a commitment and a sacrifice to Jesus Christ. The bottom line is she gave everything, and the text actually says she gave, she contributed, they contributed out of all that they had, their abundance, she out of her poverty, and she gave all she had to live on. The word actually made, she gave basically her life. She's got nothing else. She gave it all to Jesus. It reminds me of that hymn I've sung 10,000 times. I haven't sung it in church since probably 1984, but that's great hymn, I Surrender All. 
everything to Jesus. You know what? Jesus said, hey, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross daily. If you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and come and follow me. He's calling us to die. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. Hey, a call to discipleship is a call to come and die. To surrender everything to Jesus. That's the point of this whole thing. And all the stuff he's going to say and all this thing, that's what Jesus is looking for. It's just a sacrifice. The spirit of, of a sacrifice of a life and the sacrifice of a life who just surrenders all to Jesus Christ. God, I, I, I'm giving you all that I am, all that I have, all of my future, and I'm trusting you in everything, for everything, for the rest of my life and into heaven. Because ultimately this woman has nothing else to live on, and she's trusting her God. That's, uh, that, that's what it's about. Well, from there... Jesus goes, and uh, that's the sign of the widow, surrendering everything to Jesus. And then the sign of, of what's coming, and what's coming first is the destruction of the temple. And he's already said that real quick. We've got to just read this. Verse 5. And while some were speaking of the temple and how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, and it, it, uh, he said, uh, they're looking at the uh, temple and just admiring it. And it was magnificent. You ought to read some of the uh, things written about the Herod's uh, temple in the first uh, century. It was just a, one of the wonders of the world, just overlaid in gold and just marble and just, it, it, was, it, 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 it was so much stuff. When the uh, uh, sun hit it, uh, hit it and reflected off it, they said you couldn't even look at it. It would, it, would just, it would just blind you. It was so glamorous and so glorious. And it's huge. You know what? It's still, you go there today, it's still overwhelming and incredible. You can imagine what it was like back then in the first century when you got desert everywhere. And all of a sudden you walk up and there's the old city of Jerusalem and this magnificent temple. And they're just honoring this thing and adoring this thing. And then Jesus makes this statement. He says, verse 7. Uh, or verse 6, and as for these things uh, that you see, he said, this temple, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And so they ask him, they say, teacher, when will these things be? Now that's fascinating because Jesus just makes a statement. You know what? This temple is coming, will, one day will not be here anymore. And that's the most unthinkable statement to make it's just impossible what you're uh, uh, telling me this all this one day is going to be gone well in 40 years it was AD 70 it was totally destroyed and what's fascinating Jesus said hey there's not going to be one stone on another and it's fascinating because the Romans who, who did the seas against Jerusalem and just essentially destroyed everything but, but, but Titus the Roman general said hey the temple is to be spared. He told his men, he told his army, hey, we're going to destroy everything and we're going to kill everybody, but we're going to save the temple because it was just, well, it, it, was, it was worth a fortune. Well, of course, Titus' word said, hey, we're going to save this thing. Jesus' word it says, hey, it's all coming down. Well, you know, even though the Roman army and Caesar and all of them said their thing, a bottom line, there was a, a, there was a fire, stuff happened, it went out, and it just it ended up destroying the whole thing. It just reminds us, you know, Jesus, Jesus knows all. He knows what's going to happen. His word is true. It always happens. The whole world says this is impossible, but Jesus' word lasts forever. It's true. It's forever. And, and we can trust it. And he says it's all coming down. And it did. And so they ask him. When will these things be? What will the signs be when all these things are about to take place? He asked him, well, these are the signs of what's, of what's coming next. A destruction of the uh, temple. That's going to happen in the next 40 days. And then he has all these things he's going to say about um, all these things coming. Dark days are coming, is what he says. And here he's, uh, here's how he says this. There are five things he mentioned, things coming now. Now, scholars are not sure if, if, if he's actually speaking about what's happening in the next 40 years to the disciples, to, to between the crucifixion and, and resurrection of Jesus and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, or if it's in the times, prophecy, and all that. Could be either. Could be both. Actually, every age and every uh, Christian in all of history, this 
or could apply to them. Because here, here's what he said that is, is coming. And there's actually uh, five things he's going to say. There's going to be false, a false Christ, uh, a fearful times and crises. There's going to be adversaries everywhere. And there's going to be invading armies. Here's uh, that's how he says it. Look at verse 8. And he says this. And, and he said, see that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. There's going to be false Christ, always has been, always will be. But he says, hey, you, your faith and your hope is in me, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, don't go after any of them. And the second, he says, hey, there's going to be a, a fearful crisis. There's going to be natural uh, calamities and things, he says. Verse 9, and when you hear of wars and, and, and uh, tumults, don't be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end is not, will not be at once. It's not here yet. There is going to be uh, uh, wars and rumors of wars, and you know what? There uh, uh, here of wars, tumults. A tumult means just unrest, uh, instability, disorder, uh, confusion. Obviously, that's our world since then. That's our world now more than ever before, and there's going to be wars. There's going to be, and, and he says that next in verse 10, nation's going to rise against a nation, kingdom against a kingdom. Uh, it's just going to be, and, and, and of course, World War I was known, known as the Great War, the war to end all wars. Of course, it used to be through all of history. It was just this army against this army, but now things have happened, and the whole world is at war. Just everyone is involved in the thing. It's just, it's just beyond. It's just... It's just now there's total war and just nation against nation, world against the world, just all consuming business of slaughter. Is that what we are? Then he says, hey, there's going to be national calamities as well. Verse, uh, verse 11, there's going to be earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences, and there's going to be terrors and great signs from heaven. It, it just, it just uh, earthquakes are going to be more frequent and severe. Famines are going to be everywhere. Pestilences, viruses, all of that chemical thing, all that's happened. And then he says, third, of all that's uh, uh, what happened, that is happening, there's going to be adversaries. Uh, men, uh, you will be persecuted, he says. Look at this, verse 12. But before all of this, they will lay your, their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors, my, to namesake. You will be persecuted. Of course, in the books of Acts, it's, it's all about the persecution uh, under the hands of the Romans, under Nero. All of that happened here. You will be prosecuted. You're going to be thrown in jail. Verse, uh, verse 12, uh, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons. We were bought. But when that happens to you, he said, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. To be. When you're on trial, you don't worry about clearing your name, he says. You worry about proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And he says, this will be your opportunity to witness. And, and I think this is fascinating that Paul experiences in Philippians 1. Paul is in prison in, in Rome. Listen to this. And, and, and Paul says this. He makes this great statement that just, that just um, um, amplifies this, uh, th this idea. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, all this has happened to me, being in prison and all this has served to advance the gospel. Because me being in prison, he says, verse 13, that's become known through the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of my imprisonment is for Christ. He's in prison. He says, you know what? All I'm doing in prison is just testifying to the name of Jesus Christ. He's, he said, that's going to happen to us. It has. It is. And uh, uh, you will be provoked. He says, look at this, verse 16, he says this, that, uh, well, first, for in, in, in the prison, verse 13, this is your opportunity to bear witness, men. Settle it beforehand in your minds not to meditate before how you're going to answer. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say because God says, I will give you a mouth and I will give you wisdom which none of your adversaries are going to be able to withstand or, or contradict. It's just the power of God. And then, are you going to be provoked? You see, you, verse 16, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And, and some of you will be put to death. And men, you will be hated by everybody for my name's sake. 
but not a hair, you will be preserved, of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now, he's not saying, hey, you will not, not suffer being martyred, but you know what? You're going to be the center of God's will. And God says, I got your hair, a uh, number of hair on your head numbered. And you know what? Nothing's going to happen to you unless it's my desire and will for it to happen. You know what? It happened to Jesus. He was crucified. It could happen to us. It could happen to them. He says that this come. And then the fourth one is that, hey, there, there will be invading armies. And here's how he says that. Verse 20, he says, uh, uh, this is destruction of Jerusalem. Real quick. He, uh, he says, that when you see a Jerusalem surrounded by armies, that happened in A.D. 70, you will know that its desolation has come near. And then let those who in Judea, uh, uh, that area, flee to the mountains, and let them who are on, on the inside of the city depart, and let not those who are in the country go back into it. Uh, uh, these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. And for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants until day, there will be great distress upon the earth, wrath, wrath against these people, that's the nation of Israel. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be captive in all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles. All of that happened in A.D. 70. Jerusalem, there was a siege. Romans decided, we're going to destroy this whole Jewish thing. And they surrounded the city. And scholars believe that 1.1 million Jews were killed in this siege. And the temple was destroyed. In fact, scholars said, I read this in some book, that Romans crucified Jews by the thousands. Every time they caught a Jew, they said they crucified them. And the only time they stopped crucifying Jews is because they were running out of wood. Just uh, when Jerusalem finally surrendered, 97,000 Jews were shipped to various parts of the Roman world as slaves or to the arena. And just as it says there in Jerusalem that Jews are, 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 are dispersed out of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is trampled on the foot of Gentiles, all of that has happening. It is happening. It's, 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 it's taking place. And, of course, Jerusalem has been held by the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Crusaders, the, uh, the uh, Arabs, the Turks, the British, the United Nations, the Muslims are there now, and Jews are there as well. But all of that happened exactly the way Jesus happened. So here's the last point, number four, the, uh, or number three, the events leading to the return of Christ. And here are, uh, he said, uh, said there are going to be some signs. But he wants us to see, hey, there will be some signs. But I want you to see the Son of Man. And you're going to hear this sermon. And then you're going to see the Savior. Here's how he says that, verse, verse 25. And there will be signs in, uh, in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. Things are going to be happening in the heavens that just <coughs> are perplexing to the world. The world doesn't understand. They don't know what's happening. Can't explain it. But for the Christian, <coughs> excuse me, the believer in Jesus Christ, hey, we are trusting in our God who is in control of the heaven, who is above all the heavens, who is Lord of everything. And this one who's in charge of this, uh, verse, verse 26, people uh, will be, because of the perplexity, Fainting with fear, with for boding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Incredible things will take place, but what is going to happen? They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's going to happen one day. They're going to see Jesus. And what's amazing, the one who's saying this thing is Jesus, dressed in robes as a poor a peasant, even though he's the savior of the world, but he's saying, you know, I'm going to come again as the son of man, as the king of kings, as the Lord of lords, in power and glory, and you will be seen, and every knee is going to see, every eye is going to see, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that this Jesus Christ is Lord. He is coming one day, and so he says, he starts this little sermon as a result. Here's what he says, verse 28. 
that when these things begin to take place, men straighten up, raise your head because your redemption is drawing nigh. The time is short. The time to be saved is now. I mean, the time to live for Jesus is now. The time to be faithful, to love your wife, to love your kids, to walk in holiness, to tell another man Jesus, to read the Bible, to pray. The time is now. It is here. And so he tells them a parable. A part of this message about the fig tree, that hey, when it sprouts, it, 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 it says it's the end, and, and it's time coming. Verse 34, he says again, but men, watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and, and drunkenness and cares of this life. That day upon you was suddenly like a trap. He's going to say four words here. Uh, I, he's going to say, men, watch, men, stay awake. I mean, pray always and stand. Stand up for God because one day we're going to stand up before him. So he says this, men, watch yourselves. Watch. Hey, sin is everywhere. There is dissipation and drunkenness, ungodliness, immorality. Men, sin, sin is crouching at your door. You watch. You be on alert. You keep, as Shiver said earlier, your head on a swivel. You're in... Uh, a ready position, your sin just, that word sin just means, uh, uh, Hebrews use the word sin to miss the mark. Greek, uh, uh, Hebrews use the word sin to miss the point of life. Uh, Greeks use it, uh, missing the mark. You know what? In a personal relation with Jesus Christ and living for him, you know what? You don't miss the point. You don't miss uh, the mark. You live for him, he says, you watch. And verse 36, you stay awake all, at all times. You don't sleep. Men just have a, a tendency just to sleep through life, just to sleep through the day, just, just, just doing the um, urgent and just not living in light of eternity. He says, you don't sleep. In fact, I was going to read this, but, but I don't have much time. But Romans 13 is just uh, verse 11. Just reminds us again, hey, men, besides this, verse 11, Romans 13. You know the time, men. The hour has come for you to awaken from sleep, to wake up. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So men, let us therefore cast off the, the works of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling or, or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. He says to stay awake constantly and to pray always, he says. That's that phrase right there. Stay awake at all times, praying, men, that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. To stand. You know, Ephesians 6 just reminds us again about standing. Ephesians 6, one of the great passages in the Bible. Men, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the uh, uh, schemes of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, cosmic powers and presence. Therefore, <laughs> you take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, to stand in that evil day and have an all done everything, done all, stand firm. Therefore, men, stand. Just we'll stand. Uh, he wants us to stand strong with Jesus all the way uh, to the end. And then at the end, uh, last thing, here's what he says. He wants us to see the signs. Yes, there will be some signs. See the Son of Man, yes. Uh, uh, here's the sermon. Here's the message. And here's the Savior. After all of that, verse 37. And every day, Jesus was teaching in the temple. But at night, he went out and lodged on the mount, on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Just to Jesus, all of this Jesus, the Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Glory, standing there. His disciples, just doing what God has called him to do, preaching every day, teaching the people, ministering to uh, the people. And at the end of chapter 21, starts 22, and basically the countdown to Calvary has begun. Now Jesus could have done anything. He could walk away. 
He could not do this. He knew what was going to be involved in this because he prayed, Lord, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. He could have done anything he wanted to do. He could have turned his back on the whole thing, but that had been decided long ago in the halls of heaven. And it's, it's the reason why he came. He is the, the Passover of the Lamb. This is the purpose of all of heaven. It's, it's, it's the gospel story. He's writing and living. So he sets his face toward a Jerusalem. And the countdown has begun. And, and, and he's going to experience all of this that we might be saved. Here's the point. What kind of man? Of course, that's Jesus. He's the son of God. What kind of man is going to go with him? all the way to the end. Well, that may be the reason why I included the uh, little widow story. It's a man who makes a decision. I'm giving everything I have to Jesus. I'm surrendering it all. Uh, Jesus, I want to be saved and I realize there's nothing in me that can save me because of the sin in my life. And I'm surrendering my life as well as, as I understand, as much as I can. I'm surrendering all to you. Okay, Jesus, save me now. Forgive me of my sin. Now make me a new man, a new creation in Christ. And Jesus, give me the gift of eternal life. I receive it now. And then, Jesus, I'm surrendering my life to you. This day is yours. And God, whatever I do, I want to represent you. And wherever I go, I want to honor you. And Lord, I want to be more concerned about your name than my name. And magnifying Jesus in everything I do. Jesus, I'm surrendering my marriage, my wife, us, our lives. God, God, help us as we surrender everything to you. You make us one, truly one in love and relationship and just experience maybe what we've never experienced before. Jesus, I'm giving you my family, my Natalie, Melissa, and James. And now their spouses, and now those 12 grandkids. God, I'm giving it all to you. My day is yours. My tomorrow is yours. God, whatever you have for me, all this stuff, hey, bring it on. Bring the armies on, the pestilence, the famine, just all the, bring it on. I am following Jesus. You know how I love in, in just the midst of all of the, you know, the whole, uh, I love stories that just, you know, movies and books and things that just, when the bad guy is going to win and everything is in his favor and, you know, there's no way, it, it can't happen. Somehow, some way, the good guy wins. Those are the best movies. You know, I love the whole, and this is stupid, I know, but Lord of the Rings. At the end of the second film and the third film, the second book and the third book, both conclude the same way. You're in an impossible situation. There's no way. There's a billion orcs out there. And they're coming. I mean, I mean, they're everywhere. There's no way. There's a little group there. And then something supernatural happens, and, and those orcs are defeated, and it's, it, it's over, and they win. That's how God, men. Hey, if God can handle the orcs, he can handle all the stuff. You know what? He can handle my little, this having a week, of, of this week with all the stuff in the house and all the stuff in the yard and all the stuff in the mess and all the stuff. And now I got a car that's broken. I got to leave here and go help Sheila. I mean, all, he can handle all that stuff. What's the point of all this? Hey, whatever life throws at me, whatever Satan wants to throw at me, hey, whatever nature wants to throw at me, whatever the world, whatever. I'm throwing my lot with Jesus. I know he's Lord. I know he's God. I know he's in control. And all I'm doing is following him and trusting him through it all. 
You know what's, uh, what's, what's just incredible about all that, about these guys and Jesus on the way to the cross? Man, they have discovered the mission for their life. This is why I'm here. And yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's hell. Yeah, it's all, it's all of this. But you know what? This is why God created me. They have found it, and you know what? And they, and they, on, they are on actually the, the adventure of a lifetime. Men, do you have that? You have something in your life that you know, this is, my, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it don't matter what happens around me. I'm not deterring from what my face is, 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 is set toward whatever it is God wants me to do. It's like Jesus and those disciples, their face is set toward Jerusalem. This is why I'm here. It's what I'm supposed to be doing. God, give me that mission. And, of course, it's all about Jesus. Well, let's spend a few minutes just, just kind of uh, at your table, just kind of talking, sharing, whatever, praying. And, and then after a few minutes, I'll, I'll close it up. And we'll have a special time of prayer for our church and for this Sunday and services. Let's spend a few minutes together.
All right. Uh, let me wrap it up. And if, if we're going to have just a time of prayer, and if you, if you want to get on your knees, and uh, just as we go uh, in agreement, and, uh, you know, before I pray, uh, you know, the Lord, in, uh, as far as this widow and the mites and everything, he, he's not as, as, as interested in uh, how much a person gives, a man gives. That because all these rich guys gave, had so much. They gave a bunch, but it didn't even cost them. They had plenty left. Uh, he's more interested in what we have left after we've given. And what she had left was nothing. Yep. But you know what? Once we have nothing, the one who fills it up is God. God's the one who shows up. Man, when we get saved, we got nothing. And we come to him, and what does he do? He, he does what God does. He shows up, he forgives, he cleanses, he, he makes everything new. When we empty ourselves, God fills us with himself, which is awesome. Well, men, you know, this weekend, obviously, I, I, it's going to be a totally new thing in, this, in, in our church. We got a beautiful sanctuary we can't use. We got all that fancy stuff in there. We got none of that. In one sense, you know what? We're coming to God and say, God, we need you. And you know, when we confess our need, God shows up with his, his abundance, his blessing, his above and beyond. And my experience in life and in ministry is, when stuff like this happens and just it just changes everything, uh, why not pray, ask God, do something supernatural this weekend in this place here. Service is going to be happening here, but there's only a 1,000 people can meet here. They're going to be out there in the hall. They're going to be in the commons. They're going to be in the chapel. They're going to be in rooms every place, and we're going to show those. But well, God, it's so, it, it, it's so out of what we normally do. God, now maybe this would be just a moment, an experience that God just shows up in the Spirit of God, which is everywhere, obviously. But man, sometimes he shows up powerfully active in a place, in a moment, and Jesus does something. Man, I want us to pray for that. You know what? I want us to pray for our pastor. I pray for Dr. Jack Graham. And of course, I feel some of this, but you know, he's, he's the shepherd over all of this. And he feels all of this, I mean, hugely. Of course, we all do, but he does. You know, he's going to preach. And of course, he's preached 10,000 times. And he's got so many sermons in his head and heart and his files. But why not just uh, pray for our pastor, God, just do a supernatural work in him and just... As good as he is, may he be empty of anything and everything but Jesus. And may Jesus come through loud and clear through our pastor this Sunday, through the worship and the message. And may, may we see people saved and just lives touched and just whatever. So, man, here's what I want us to do. I want us to pray, all of us at the same time, all of us out loud, and just praying on behalf. I want us to fill this room and just... Say it out loud so heaven heal, hears, angels hears, the Satan himself and all of his demons hear God's men in this moment, praying on behalf of God's church, which is Prestonwood. And obviously, we want to pray for any church and every church, and, and also a prayer for our pastor this weekend and what God's going to do in this place. So God, Lord, lead us. Men, pray out loud right now for a minute or two to our God. Then I'll close this.
Lord, how wonderful it is and just to hear the rumbling of good men, godly men. Obviously, we're not, we're all sinners saved by grace. But because we are sinners saved by a grace, we are saints in Christ. We are clothed in Jesus' righteousness. We're holy, righteous, perfect in Christ. And God, I thank you for the sound of this of, of the rumbling of, of godly men who are trusted in Jesus, uh, boldly approaching the throne of grace to receive help and mercy in time of need. And this is a time of need, and we're boldly approaching, and we're asking. And God, God, we've asked. And I'm just praying that God is just, this has begun with a little rumbling of these men uh, praying that just as you did in, 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 in the first uh, century in the book of Acts, you just, your spirit moved and just the whole foundation and the walls of the building just shook and in one sense you shook a building you shook a people you 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 shook up the whole world and god may you do that god that's our prayer and god uh, maybe somebody says oh that's that's so far out there there's no way well you said that uh, we don't want to be guilty of having not because we ask not so god that's what we're asking and we're praying for Dr. Graham that you'll bless him, you'll give him a peace, you'll give him a message, and he won't be anxious about it at all. He won't worry about it. God, he'll just know this is what you want me to say, and he'll stand up, and, and that you'll so fill him with your spirit, and he'll just speak and preach as, as, as good as he always is. God, just may this be just God, totally, speaking through a man to a people. And that your word will go forth and will not return void. It will accomplish what you intend for it to accomplish. And people are going to be saved. And men are going to get right with you. And men are going to be, and women are going to be restored in their relationships and their marriages and their families. And you're going to, you're going to save a bunch. And you're going to have a, a people added to the church. All of that. God, that's our prayer. And God, I pray that prayer for churches all around the world. And of course, we got our issues here, our things here, and churches all over the place have, have major attacks, major things happening. Yeah, we pray for them. We pray for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for anyone who's going to stand up and share the message this weekend, that God, you would bless them. And may, may there be revival, a spiritual awakening, uh, maybe another great one, just as there has been several times in the course of, of history. God, may there be another one. Before you come again, to may you save millions uh, and, and turn us to faith in you. God bless these men. God help us to be faithful. God help us to allow.